if you can learn how to lead people, now you can lead from the bottom as well as the top. Business of Architecture, episode 393. Hello, and welcome back, Architect Nation. My name is Enoch Sears, and in today's show, I'm going to let you in on an interview that I had with architect Michael Smith. Michael Smith runs an architectural practice on the Central California coast, and last year, he reached out to me to interview me on his podcast. And so today, we're going to talk about what it's like running a small architectural practice. We talk about marketing a small architectural practice. We talk about podcasting and much, much more. So with that... Here's my interview with Michael Smith. Well, welcome, everyone. Uh, Thank you for joining us at Michael Smith Architect Podcast. Today's episode, we have a really special guest. Um, We're kind of veering off course from our normal uh, contractors and clients and uh, talking about building construction sets. So we'll probably do a little bit of that. But I've got on the show Enix Sears. Uh, he is an architect and uh, entrepreneur and delves in his business, delves in uh, marketing and such. But rather than me butchering everything, why don't I welcome Enoch to the show and he can tell us a little bit about himself. How you doing? Hey. Yeah, yeah, Mike. So so good to talk to you. And I know we've corresponded in the past frequently. So I'm, it's really an honor and pleasure to be on here on the show. Love what you're doing, first of all, that you're implementing the kind of things that I... Uh, I like to tell architects and everyone they should be doing, just having some way to broadcast your message, your voice, what you're doing out there to the world. And so absolutely fantastic. And, you know, most people don't understand what it takes to get outside of yourself and broadcast. So I really want to acknowledge you for that, yeah, Mike, like you. really, because people don't understand. They, they listen to podcasts and it's funny how I get, I run a podcast myself and I'll get all sorts of, I get my fair share of hate comments. People saying that episode, the sound quality was messed up. Oh my goodness, it sounded like you were interrogating the, the, the guest wow. you know, and all these negative comments. And people just don't understand that it takes something to actually put yourself on camera, yeah. uh, to, to, to arrange an interview, to put yourself out there, up for criticism. And I remember I had procrastinated starting my podcast for months and months and months until I had casually asked someone to be on my podcast. I said, you know, I'm going to do a podcast sometime in the future. Would you like to be a guest? And she said, yeah, that sounds great. How about next week? Oh, I nailed you. Yeah. And then from then, Mike, I was hooked and I couldn't stop. So that was back in, that was back in uh, December of 2011. My first podcast guest was Osha Wilson. And so a part of my story is, yes, uh, I'm a licensed California architect. And after going out east to school, uh, going working in different parts of the U.S. and the world, um, I was actually found myself down in, in Panama in Central America with, at the time I had been maybe out of school 10 years, maybe less, seven years. Okay. And it was really my dream job. I mean, I'm an, I'm an outdoor kind of surfer kind of guy. And so we were living on a Caribbean island. This was in t- 2007, doing speculative kind of development design work and Oh, it was just incredible. I, thought, I have, I have, I've achieved the pinnacle of success of my career. And then, of course, you know, something influenced your career as well. All of us as architects was the the Great Recession, as they yeah. called it, in two thousand and seven, when everything came crashing down. So, I was, you know, the company let me know that my my days were numbered. <laughs> down on my beautiful Caribbean paradise in Panama and that we had better pack up our bags. And so we did, we packed up our bags and went back to Houston where the mother company was. And at that time I was just trying to figure out what was next. And I had known that I always wanted to do my own thing. I wanted some form of entrepreneurship because for me, freedom was really important. The freedom to experiment, the freedom to work and have a lot of variety in my day. And, um, so I ended up back in Fresno because we, I was raised in Lemoore, California, which is if you're going from the Central Valley out to uh, San Luis, of course, that's right on the way. And so we moved back to the Central California Valley, and you said you used to practice in Modesto, and you know it well, uh, yep. because this is where I grew up, and we have lots of family here. And arriving here in 2008, well, Ooh. you know how it was. Yeah, for it was, it was bad. Valley. Yeah, yeah, in 2008, right? I called up all the local firms. Uh, you know, no one had work, yeah. and a few that did have work. I wasn't necessarily interested in doing that kind of work. So uh, I. To make ends meet, I got a paper route and I hustled. I had three small kids, a wife, you know, family, mm. bills to pay. And, uh, and then I did substitute teaching at Fresno High. And it was, wow. it was that moment yeah. after having gone through school, after having 
uh, spent lots of time learning how to be an architect, learning my craft, and doing what I thought were all the quote unquote right things to succeed in life. Found myself waking up at one o'clock in the morning through newspapers in the cold Central Valley, California, you know, California um, environment. I was like, there's, there's something that I'm missing here. There's something in my life plan or the way that I've structured my choices that I have completely missed. And that began my journey to try to figure out what that thing was. And I knew that thing had to do with money. So as an architect, one thing that I never cared about or in school was money. I figured, you know, it'll come if I just do good work and focus on that, that it'll work itself out just because I'll just hang up my shingle and be successful. Yeah. And since then I discovered that, that there, there is a skill. Yep. <laughs> it's just like that, right, Mike? Yeah. That's, you find. That's all you do. Yeah, big big commissions coming in the door, yeah. and you know all sorts of the the fantastic stuff we design in school. I mean, you spend your whole day doing. You're turning away clients like that, you know, yep. unlimited budgets. <laughs> so yeah, so I had you know a good reality knock me upside the head, shall we say? And then I I just went into um. I've always been very tenacious about figuring things out when they're not working for me, and so I said, okay, I got to figure this thing out of business. And when I was working in Panama, the company we worked for was run by a very successful businessman. And so I had gotten to see part of his world. We'd go over to his house and we'd see how he had this beautiful 10,000 square foot home on the lake with, you know, a BMW, a Mercedes Benz, a G-Wagon, you know, like just lots of money. And I'd never mm -hmm. seen that much kind of wealth. And I thought, you know what, he's, there's something about what he's doing in his life that I'm completely oblivious to and I have no clue about. Yeah. And so that began my deep dive into business and just researching and interviewing other people on the podcast and really trying to crack that nut of how to be financially successful as well as fulfilled and everything like that. Because I'd yeah. focused on the fulfillment before, but let's face it, you can't be very fulfilled when you, well, I mean, you can and you can't, but if I'm out there no. throwing papers, it's a rough life. I'm just yeah. going to leave it. Or you're, or you're running after that, you know, that client that owes you that, that check for three weeks. And instead of being calm, you, you start getting a little panic because it's getting near yeah. the end of the month. And yeah, absolutely. So, yeah, I, I mean, it definitely adds, it's sort of like, I, I heard, you know, there's the, the Maslow's hierarchy of needs. I mean, there's a threshold that I've heard where people say money doesn't buy you happiness, doesn't buy you love. They've shown that I think in the U.S. it's around $60,000, $70,000 for an individual. Once you kind of hit a certain level of income, yeah. you're right, it doesn't add to it. You know, if I have my basic needs provided for and then I become a millionaire, I'm not going to become much more happy, maybe even more stressed out. But if I'm below that, you better believe I'm going to be, uh, be stressed and worried. Absolutely. So, you okay, so you moved back to Fresno. Uh, you couldn't, you know, you're, you're throwing papers. And, and I tell you, I know that it's a little humbling um, when I closed down my firm in Modesto and moved, you know, we decided, I looked at my wife and I said, we can either suffer in the heat in Modesto or we can suffer over in San Luis Obispo where we both went to school. Wow. And she said, well, what about the kids? They're in school. And we looked at them and says, Modesto or San Luis? And they, they were San Luis all the way. Amazing. So we moved here and again, you know, I, there's no thought. It's just, we just made the leap. And I was drafting for uh, a steel window and door company to kind of get my feet wet. And then that ended. And again, I did no marketing. I did nothing while I was here um, and met maybe, you know, a couple contractors who gave me some work. Uh, but I ended up working at Home Depot in the appliance department. And I had to do it because we had to, you know, it's very expensive to live here. My wife had a job. I had to make sure I was 40 hours a week. And it was humbling. You know, at first I'm like, going, yeah. I can't believe I'm a professional. I'm an architect. How can I do this in the town yeah. that I went to school with? But, you know, after I embraced it a little bit and said, hey, you do what you have to do. I actually got three of my best clients servicing them as investors that came in and no one gave anybody service. And I just said, okay, what do you need? What can I do for you? How can I help you? And you know, that's when I started to realize if you help them, it will come back. And yes, I always have to worry about the money, but it's the service that comes first and know that 
you know, when people know they care about you, then they'll start caring about me. And I think that's really is the case. Um, yeah. Sorry, not to go off course there a little bit, but no, I okay, love so it. you and came back to Fresno, you had the bike job, you saw the, how the other side lived. So what was the first step? You know, you obviously veered away from, I, I mean, you're still a licensed architect. Are you doing architecture at all? Or are you in? Well, if, if you wanted me to stamp a plan, I could stamp it. Meaning, okay. Uh, yeah, I still keep my, my registration. Uh, uh, only if it's under your control, right? Yeah, that's right. That's right. That's right. As long as, you know, I, <laughs> you're, you're here's the thing. You know, I don't know that I'll ever give that up because I'll continue yeah. paying the registration fees because of all the time and heartache and investment Absolutely. I put in becoming an architect. Like, that's almost just a trophy. And I have my license over there on the wall and it's like, I'll keep that. But, you know, the day may come in the future that I, I do some other ventures and maybe that becomes important again where I want to do a little bit of architecture. But, you know, architecture is a technical job. And yeah. I found that I don't, I'm not in love with the technical aspect of it. When I say technical, that would refer to design as well. I'm just referring to the craft of architecture. Yeah. It doesn't interest me as much as making deals happen, talking to people, entrepreneurship, business, uh, sharing content, talking ideas, big picture strategy, training teams, leadership management. I mean, that's all the stuff that I'm really excited and, and love and all now. the stuff they don't talk about in school. I keep going back to that because I, I commiserate yeah. with a friend of mine. We went to school together, and that's the one thing I'm just harping on. He's a teacher at Cal Poly in fourth and fifth year classes. And I, I say, are you taking him aside and telling him, you know, it's not just, hey, I want to be head designer and that's it and everything's going to be great. It's, you know, you guess you're going to be at the bottom. And if you decide to go out on your own, all the things they need to do, I mean, I just hammer them because it is so difficult to wear all those hats that you just said and do the design and the working drawings. Absolutely. And I think, you know, just, just take one, one of those things. So leadership skills <laughs> is so important because if I would have had better leadership skills, I would have been a better employee because I know looking back that, I, I was I was a good technical employee. I was good. I showed up on time. I gave it my all. But in terms of probably, you know, and I, I pleased the clients. I did everything I could to succeed because I was very driven, you know, kind of person and architect. But what I did find is that I didn't really like the corporate environment. You know, I wanted to work for smaller yeah. firms because it just felt like in the corporate environment, there was so much, you know, brown nosing, politicking, you know, who gets a raise, who's the buddies with who and everything. And I was just turned off by that. But now in my later years, what I realized is that it was just my lack of people skills that I, I didn't really understand leadership and I didn't understand how to work really well in that sort of team environment. You know, so I think for maybe some of our listeners who are growing in their careers at certain stages, if you can learn how to lead people. Now you can lead from the bottom as well as the top. Yeah. Right. So you can lead your boss in a way you can show up as a leader for that person, not meaning that you're going to be commanding them what to do, but that's not what we mean by leadership. Yeah. We mean being able to influence and persuade people and help them get what they want. Like you said, your wonderful example of working at Home Depot, um, but then working with your clients and helping them get what they want, gets you what you want. Exactly. There's a lesson that I wish I would have learned I knew it intellectually, but I wish I would have known it deeper when I was younger. And that, that is absolutely true because I, I think that is, I've kind of impressed it upon my children who are now out working in the corporate world and such. And I just say, you know, guys, you give it your best, but it's essentially, it's a people person job, whether it's employees that you're you may have one or two that you're overseeing, you need to give them pep talks and help them along, help them move up because that will help you move up. And mm -hmm. that's, you know, I, I did the corporate once. I, I just, I, I think I'm just too independent. I hate having someone tell me what to do, even though they're most of the time they were right looking back. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, I just didn't like that at all. And, and even in the midst of all the despair and blackness of no work and such, and my wife said, you know, you could be hired by three firms of people you know. Why don't you do that? And I said, oh, no, I, I, I couldn't do that. I couldn't even if they said you don't have to wear a tie. I just, it's just not me. And I'd rather struggle. I'd rather work 50, 60-hour weeks on my own stuff and leading my own team and that. So, yeah. Um, 
Okay, so you you didn't want to go on the technical side. What was it why you were kind of in Fresno looking back on what you did for the previous 10 years? Or was there some point that, you know, kind of galvanized it for you? Galvanized what? Um, you're thinking to change from being the technical architect to more on helping architects to yeah, manage so, and grow yeah, their business. Good question, right? So business of architecture has developed into something that I hadn't planned originally, right? Which is now we're a consultancy and we help architects run a more fulfilling, profitable and practice that helps them really achieve their vision. That's really aligned with them. So we help them build authentic businesses that are aligned with what they want in terms of design, what they want really to help them be, you know, live out the best version of their life is cliche as that may sound. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I, I was never the principal of a 50 person firm. You know, um, I was in leadership positions and I did run my own firm. So I understand it from a management aspect, but at business of architecture, we've brought in other experts and assembled a team of people where, you know, we have, we have that expertise and that's how we help our clients. Right. So how did I get into it? Well, it kind of fell into place because as I started sharing information on the podcast, about what I was going through, what I was discovering. This was years ago. You know, architects, uh, not unlike myself and yourself, we're, we're thinking this is great. Uh, this is something not a whole lot of people are talking about right now. And so I started forming relationships. And then people started reaching out to me and asking for help because I was particularly skilled in the marketing and the web side of things, like the digital marketing side. So I started doing some consulting work with architects, helping them with their websites, helping them be able to, you know, set up kind of a lead generation process um, through that, sharing content, et cetera. And, and then eventually I had a, a friend of mine who reached out, Eric Bobro, who is a, a big time Archicad trainer, and he was going to launch an online program called Internet Marketing for Architects. He'd already done it, and this was like, I think the third time he was launching it, mm -hmm. and he wanted someone to help him run the logistics of selling this, this online course or this program at the time when Internet Marketing was very new uh, in terms yeah. of architects really optimizing their websites and doing the things that you're doing now, things like podcast and content production and things like that. And so I helped, I helped Eric do that. Uh, we sold the course program, uh, made a bunch of friends in terms of architects who signed up to the program and made a decent amount of money at the same time. And I thought, oh, I guess there's other ways to make money than being an architect. <laughs> I'm like, fancy that. Yeah. You know, there's other things to do besides architecture. And uh, I just loved it. And so from that point forward, I focused on the, the teaching and the training side, which is really funny because I grew up, my dad was a teacher. And the one thing I swore that I would never do was to be a teacher. And here I am, which is basically what I am. I'm a, I'm a highly paid teacher, uh, but that's ultimately at the core of what I do. That's absolutely. Okay. And so I've seen, you know, like you mentioned, I was enrolled in one of your programs. And so I'm, I was well aware of that. Is that where you're, you're reaching out is through social media and, and putting on uh, uh, webinars and things like that? Yeah, so that's how we've grown business of architecture is through uh, through holding webinars, through connecting, and and other architects are attracted to our information because of what we share. We break it down, we make it simple. Yeah, you know, that's one of the big things that we do is we don't necessarily think that every architecture firm needs to run like their fifty person firm. So we take the best strategies from the best run firms and distill them down into a way that even sole practitioners can implement them and see a dramatic difference by implementing these small changes in their business. So what would you say the number one concern or things that your clientele is looking for? Well, uh, we work with architects, landscape architects, interior designers. Okay. And all of their needs are varied as professionals. And I'm sure if there's any contractors listening to your podcast, they'll, they'll identify with these things as well. But a primary thing is just the ups and downs of the cyclical nature of the business, how yeah. to forecast how much work I have and how booked out am I? Could I accept yeah. another project? Well, I don't want to turn it away because then I'll lose a potential source in the future and then you end up on taking on too much work. Yeah. And it's just, you get into this feast or famine cycle that's really difficult to manage if you're just doing it in an ad hoc manner. So okay. that's one side. And then the other side is just kind of getting better better projects with better budgets, right? Yeah. So how do we get the really 
the really good projects that align authentically with what we want to do. Those are kind of two of the top things that we hear from our clients. And frankly, they come to us with the symptoms. Now, here's the thing is we were a lot of the firms we work with, it's not like they're struggling. These aren't struggling firms. Like they're doing very well, but they want to do better. Yeah. And so a lot of times what we find is the challenges they have are in terms of leadership, uh, in terms of team dynamics. And then, you know, just small little shifts in that area can really make a firm take off. That is true. And it's, you know, it's really is, I think, and what I've, why I started all of this is I, you know, when I was in Modesto, um, I had a nice little clientele, but I ran after everything, mm. high or low. I was indiscriminate. And, you know, you, there's always that story where, you know, maybe sometimes it's better to fire the client rather than continue the project. And yeah. I, I would acknowledge that after the project, mm. after mm. I spent probably three times as much time on it. And that's really why I do everything I do is, yes, I want to educate. But eventually, people are going to, just like when you reach out to architects and you educate them, they go, oh, can you help me? And that's, you know, I want to get with those people who want my services and don't look to the last page of my proposal. They actually know what value I bring. And I, I think that is the biggest, the biggest thing that I've learned over the last 10 years is... Um, it's not about the price, it's about the value. And if they look at the price and say, you're too high, I didn't educate them on the value that I bring. Why am I different from everyone else in town um, who's going for half the price? And that's, yeah. that's the hard lesson that's taken a long time to learn and then implement. <laughs> it's such. Yeah, yeah. Well, there's, there's, one, there's one statement, you know, among the things that we teach our clients to, to basically say is stand up for themselves and just say, you know, when they're meeting with a new client, just say, look, it's a process of disqualification because not every potential client is going to be a fit for you. And so we just tell them, just frankly say to them, hey, look, there's, there, there is a reason why sometimes some people choose not to do business with us. Right. And that is that we're on, we're on the expensive side. We're expensive to work with. Yeah. Is that, is that going to be a problem? You know, they're just and for some, some clients that'll scare them away and then happy days. Okay. And I'm if, writing that down. Cause that's good. Yeah. Get it out of the way. Cause yeah, I, that's I'm, right. yeah, you do get, I do get hit with, you know, after spending a couple hours with them and doing some research and putting together the proposal and even giving them planning information. Um, then to do not hear anything for a couple of days and call them up and say, Oh, well, yeah, you were, we found someone about half price. And I'm just yeah. thinking who is, you know, in this area doing that. And it usually ends up being a, a structural engineer that ends up drafting. Um, <laughs> I go, okay, all right. You know, but you know, it's, it's letting go of that is saying, okay, that person wasn't the right fit for me. And yes, I'd love to have that job. But you know what, they, they're going to be probably so much trouble that I don't need at this, at this point in my life. And there's someone else out there that's going to come up. And so far, that, that's been the case. The Absolutely. hardest thing now is the coronavirus. You know, when, mm. when it hit, I had three employees and I flashed back to 2008. Yeah. And you know, oh, no. I hung on and drained all my savings and retirement holding on to people thinking, oh, this is just a recession. Yeah. We'll get on the other side. We'll keep going and boom, everything will be great. I, I did not hesitate to pull that trigger that time. I said, you know, sorry guys, I'm taking care of myself and my family first this time. I'm going to let y'all go. And fortunately for me, the work is continue on. Um, and now I'm struggling to get it all done. That's the, yeah. Yeah, that's the hard bring part. One of them back. Is that, that juggling? That's the truth. Here's, here's the thing. Here's the thing about that. It's difficult, very, very difficult to lay people off. Yeah. Um, I've had to do it just a couple of times. And the first time I did it was, it was heart wrenching. I didn't want to. Um, but here's the thing. You need to realize as a business owner that your primary responsibility is to the business. Exactly. Not to any one individual. Because only if you survive are you going to be able to hire someone in the future. Correct. And so it's difficult, but those things do need to happen at times. But yeah, I that you know I don't I don't you know I'm I'm 
I'm sad I did that, but I'm certainly not upset that I that I did it because I'd rather be in this position than yeah. hanging on. And it was a struggle. Uh, things were starting to slow down, and it was a struggle making payroll. And I felt like I was working for my employees and not the reverse. And that is, you know, it's getting out of that uh, owner operator mentality of, oh, I'm the architect. I have to work as hard as everyone else, even harder than anyone else. He goes, no, I'm the business owner. And they work on my business and then I oversee them. And there's some days that I don't have to put in 10 hours because my team is doing it. And that's another thing that, that I learned. Yep. Anyway, okay, so I'm sorry, I keep, I'm monopolizing your time. Um, what would well, be that, That's okay thing, because we're, we're right at the top. Our, I know, our I, I see that too, up, but I just like. want to get your one thing. So if there's an architect or contractor or interior designer, what, what's the one thing that you would tell them, you know, other than they're going to call you? But what would you tell them to kind of get them through this, you know, crisis we're going through? Mm. Well, cash flow is going to be primary. So I think everyone needs to be running a 13-week cash flow forecast. And I've prepared it just a free training. It's on YouTube, no opt-in required. If you just search business of architecture, 13-week cash flow, you can find that. And that's something that you can do as a business owner or your CPA should be able to do that for you. But that's the fuel right now. And so what that'll give you, that'll give you a 90 days outlook at your finances. So you can take corrective action today. And that's what we need to do in this environment. You should always be doing that, but it's especially important right now. Yeah. Okay, great. Well, Enoch, how do they get a hold of you if uh, someone who's listening? And I'll, we'll put it in the show notes, but why don't you... Tell us how they can yeah, get a hold. So if, if you're listening to this podcast, you're probably a podcast listener. Go check out the Business of Architecture podcast. It's Business Excellent. of Architecture. Head on over there. Have a listen. Give us a, give us a, give us a review, hopefully five stars, and you know on iTunes. And, and you can look me up on Business of Architecture. Connect with me on LinkedIn. Follow me on Instagram. Uh, it's Enoch, E-N-O-C-H, Sears, S-E-A-R-S. Awesome. Well, thank you very much, sir. I appreciate your time and being on the show. Thanks, Mike. Next time I go surfing in San Luis, I'll give you a ring and we'll meet in person, hopefully. That would be great. Okay. okay. Speak All soon. Right. Bye-bye. And that is a wrap. Today's episode is sponsored by Smart Practice Business of Architecture step-by-step -step executive training program for firm owners who want a practice that gives them freedom, creative fulfillment, and financial reward. Because you see, likely it isn't your skill as an architect or your skill as a designer that holds you back in architecture. It's everything else related to running a business, redoing staff work, trying to find the right people, keeping the right people and keeping the money flowing so it all runs smoothly. If you're ready to stop reinventing the wheel, get a proven system and simplify the running of your practice, go to businessofarchitecture.com forward slash training to discover a free video where you'll discover the smart practice method for running a practice that doesn't get in the way of your architecture. As a reminder, the views expressed on the show by my guests do not represent those of the host and I make no representation, promise, guarantee, pledge, warranty, contract, bond, or commitment except to help you conquer the world. Carpe diem.